Okay, well, <clears throat> welcome to Vance Developer Diaries number 12, I think it is. And we are going to go over the Nitro App Builder timeline widget and map widget if we have time, which I think we will. I'm gonna share my screen. Sean, let me know if you can see that. Yep. Okay, sweet. Okay, again, yeah, we're gonna go over uh, the timeline widget in Nitro App Builder and then uh, go into a little detail of the map widget. I think we'll start with just the timeline widget. So I'm going to launch App Builder. And we're gonna need data for this. But first, I guess, uh, Sean, I don't know if you have any thoughts on like explanation of the timeline widget itself, but just a way to represent your data that is based off of date and or time. But do you have anything? Yeah, to yeah. I mean, it's it's a visual representation of you know it could be anything as long as it's as long as it's date based. You know, for example, you might you might have a representation of you know a customer's. You know, I'm thinking. <laughs> Very small here, but a, a customer's uh, orders and and you know each each date that they've you know placed an order, you might want or have a need to visualize that in a timeline. Right. I don't know what we're doing today exactly. I think you said PTFs, right? Uh, yeah, there is. Uh, we can access the the PTFs when they were applied. So I thought first we would show that, which is just a date, um, and then we'll create another data source that's got mock data that is a range. So, because a timeline, you can have a start and end time, and start and end time and or date, or date and or time, sorry. This first one getting PTFs off the system is a good one because, you know, anybody should be able to do that. Right, right. So we're simply just pulling in some, um, hearing myself. Um, we're simply just pulling in uh, the description the PTF ID, um, we have the status, um, the date, and then the time. And let's make sure, so that's pretty much it. It's at, this is the library and file where we're pulling it from, and we're making sure that it's, it has a create time on there. This might take a second. Usually DB2 will, after we've done it once, it'll keep that so it's a little faster. But Okay, so yeah, here we go. So we have the status permanently applied, uh, the description, the PTF ID, and then here's our uh, create date and create time. So for, for, the, for the timeline widget, in this case, this is a, um, this is a timestamp, but a, a regular time field would be okay as well, right? Like can we we can use either that create date or that create time? Yeah, I think I'm just going to use the create date, um, but you could use both. You could use either or. It could be a date, a date value, an ISO date value, or a timestamp. Okay. So let me just say uh, PTF, and I'll D. Oh, this is good to show. So it, based off of the, the data source response time, it's, it's caching it. Yeah, and just, just to expand on that a bit. Um, so it, it detected when the data source ran that it, it took, I don't remember what the threshold is, but it, it, it took long, it, it, it took a while. So if you were going into a widget, to configure it, and when you know, you notice when you're configuring a widget, it's it's constantly refreshing itself. So if you had to wait, you know, ten seconds each time for it to refresh itself, it would just make it it would make it really cumbersome when you're uh, editing the widget, which you're going to do now. Right. So really, it's only cache for when we're in Builder itself, right? Just for right. the speed. But once we're running the application and the users would be accessing, it's not hitting the cached values 
And maybe point out too, Johnny, you can mm -hmm. cash, you can decide to cash this yourself too if you wanted, or you wanted to remove the cash. If you go to miscellaneous, you could, you know, recash it or remove the cash. So good point. Yeah. You can any data source that you have, if you want to cash it, you can just go under miscellaneous and cash it, or then <clears throat> if you've already cashed it, you could remove the cash or recash. Okay, so let's create our, let's go to the timeline. So here's our timeline widget. And <clears throat> this is fairly simple widget to set up. It's not like the grid where there's <coughs> <more stuff. clears throat> um, Of course, we need the, the field itself. So I'm just gonna create, use the create date. Um, and then we're gonna want a label field. What's gonna show on the timeline. And I will start with just the PTF ID. Let's see where we're at. Okay, so the way that the, the timeline widget works is it actually is, you, the user will take with their mouse and they can drag it around. And then they can, with the mouse, like the mouse wheel or I'm gonna max, I'm, I'm just using the pad itself. I can zoom in and out. So I'm gonna just go to this. There's a ton of these just sitting on this specific month. And we could start seeing that, you know, here's my month, the year, and then the days within it. So that is just purely based off of that create date. And then we stated, use this field for the label. So that's what we're seeing. Here's the PTF ID for all of these. Let's see. Uh, limit results. We'll, the, the end data field, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in the next data source I'm going to create, but limit results, of course, just like all the other limit, you can, you can set a specific limit that you'd want to pull. Um, of course, auto load is just as all the other widgets and also the auto refresh. This can have a tool tip added to the actual timeline item. So we could say, uh, and you can freeform type in this too, PTF, and then I'll just do uh, PTF ID dash description. So we're seeing that PTF and then IBM I access for Windows, which was the description. Um, and then, we also have UI, so of course you have a title on the widget itself. Here is the type, which is going to show differently in the timeline. So we default to box, you can change it to point. And point will just be actual, uh, you know, a dot with that value itself, with that item in the list, or not list, but timeline itself. So it's just a different way to represent it. But we always default to box course padding and then colors you can also do rules just like you are used to or seen in like the grid um, you could just do a blanket color so let's just say I, I'm not thrilled with um, the base color out of the box I could say okay well I'm gonna make it this blue and now it's that blue and you can change the background too so let's say I'm not thrilled with the default, so I'm gonna change the background to say this gray. And then just like all the widgets, you can add your user filters. Um, we do have custom formatting, so you can, just like in the grid, if you, you know, if you wanna do some kind of outside the norm, of your actual value that the user sees in the timeline, you can do that with custom formatting. So I could do turn, I haven't done this in a while, return, I don't know, uh, CNX plus value. And then now everything has CNX and then the value that was the base value for <coughs> the data field itself. I'm not going to do that though. I'm uh, not sure if there's anything else to touch on in this. It's pretty, it's, it's a simple widget for configuring at least. I don't know if Sean, do you have anything you think or? 
Uh, no, I think, um, like you said, it's, 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 there's, there's not much to, you know, once you have the data implementing, it's pretty straightforward. Right. And again, I just want to point out that when this loads, you know, the user has the ability to like zoom in and zoom out, and zoom out via the mouse and then move left to right the timeline itself with the mouse. That's how it works on, on desktop and mobile. So I'll, I'll just save this for right now. PTFs. Okay, now we will create another data source to show the timeline with a range. So I'm gonna go here and add a new data source and I have to go, I created a quick So here I'm just, just mock data, current date, end date, and some text. So, and this one is just gonna be the, the timestamp, right? So let's just save that. And we'll create the same <clears throat> widget. Um, but this time we're gonna say we wanna, there's a start and an end. So our start is gonna be the current date. Label field will pick text. And then end date will be end date. And as you can see now, the timeline is a little different. It stretches across either days, months, you know, however that length of time is between the start and the end value. So maybe a, a, a use case, at least that, that we've seen used before with customers was, you know, I think they have like a, a, a work or a shop order beginning and end, um, you know, for a yep. certain uh, range of products and, you know, they show how, how they kind of get a vis visualization of how long certain things took to, to complete. Right. And then also too, is I guess we should notate that this widget, if you're using an app, will it has the same um, behavior. So you can, you know, the user can click something, an item in the timeline, and then that could trigger behavior to go filter something else or whatever, you know, launch an app or uh, et cetera in behavior. So it does have, um, user actions against it, just like all our other widgets. So, I mean, so yeah, I don't, I mean, we already went through all the other options, so I don't think there's any point to do any more. Uh, I get, you know what, I just saw something. There is, I'm not disregard that. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> I was going to say, you know, but not, yeah, I'm not prepared for that. So forget it. Okay. Um, I'm not going to save this. There's no point, but again, just so you can see the range within the timeline itself. And then I guess we can go into the map. And I know, we, I know we've done them. Oh, someone's talking there. Oh, I thought someone was speaking up with a question. Oh, okay. Um, I know we've done the map before, but I think we haven't really, um, gone into some of the, less used features of the map, right? Right, and I don't think we touched on either is just like map setup, like how, you know, if I if I have installed Valence or got the update, you know, I was on Valence 4 or 5, and then, you know, they get the update, and now they see that there's a map widget to use it. I know I, we, in, we have a set key that we distribute, but it's not meant for customers to keep using that key. It's just so that when they load it, they can see it's working up front, but then, it's really suggested that a customer goes and gets their own Google key, API key, which is free. Um, so should we uh, first start with that? Yeah, that'd be good. Yeah, our key, when you install Valence, only lasts as long as the trial. 
once you're uh, once you're uh, you know, once you have a licensed copy, you need to have your own key. All right. So, in Portal Admin Settings, if I do let's see, Google, I'm assuming it's Google. Yes. So we have Google Maps API key, and then we ship out a key, and like Sean said, then it could get wiped out. But you really, if you're going to use the maps, you should just go get your own key. And we do have a good guide for doing that, right? I believe if we go to the guides, and then bear with me, I'm assuming it's gonna be under Matt. Here we go, perfect, creating a Google API key. So this just walks you through all the steps. You'll have to, you, you'll have, to have a, a Google account, like you know a Gmail account to start this up. Once you have the Gmail account, then you can go through here walk through these steps, agree to the terms and services. And then, you know, like I said, just walk through these steps. The big important one is the Maps JavaScript API. And at the end, where are we gonna get to it? At the end, you'll get your API key, you'll copy that, and then you'll paste it back in We'll just paste it in here. The guide is showing because if there is no key and you try to do a map, it's gonna come up and be like, hey, you, you need a key, do you wanna put it in there? And it's just a quick way if you don't have a key there and you go and walk through the steps, you could paste it here and it's gonna update the same setting, which is this Google Maps API key. So that's just allowing your apps to communicate to Google so we can render that Google Map based off of the, the locations, right? addresses, et cetera. Okay. And I have, I guess we've already like, I mean, should I just demonstrate a simple just map with just demo CMS or do I just go right into? I might do that because then maybe it'd be useful just to zero in on right. one location to show how you can, you know, set you like if you're, if you're going to use a map and you only have, you know you're filtering down to one location, you know, you might choose to zoom in as far as possible. Just, I guess your the other data source will have more flexibility than just right. our regular demo CMAS, right? Right. Okay, so we just had, we just created a quick, I just created a quick uh, data source based off of that demo CMS table that we uh, distribute with Valence that's just, just cust uh, fake customers. And we're gonna create this map widget based off that. There's the map. <clears throat> the address format is gonna be <clears throat> just the same format that you're used to um, if you're going to go to like, let's say you're going to Google Maps and you're going to type something out. So uh, I guess we could just say, okay, well, I'm going to use address line, address one, city, state, zip. Let's see what happens here. Okay. When you're in Nitro App Builder itself, when you're dealing with the map, we're always only going to load one item to the map. <clears throat> once it's in your application and running, it'll load as many as it needs to based off of your data source and, you know, uh, you know, maximum markers, which is like a limit data. So, but for just here, when you're in designer or a builder, you're, you're only going to see one. Again, marker title, this is just, okay, on click. Do we want to show something? It's like a tool tip um, on hover. You can show something. So let me go back to that and unclick. I mean, <clears throat> I clicked it. It shows it. The one thing to, to notate is that I can't remember. Sean, I don't remember, but with the Google API key, there, it, there there's a fr the free version, and then there's a paid version, and it's based off of like number of requests you can do. I think it's a second. I think it's like 
no more than five or 10 requests a second. So the first time you run it, and let's say you have, I don't know, a hundred to a thousand locations that you're trying to go get the, the, to map out the map, which really in, in the background, is just taking that location and saying, hey, you know, Google, here's this location. Also, it's gonna go and then find, find it, or attempt to find it, and get the, the latitude longitude of that location. And then we plot it on the map. When we get those responses back, we cache those in a file, we put those in a file in the IBM I so that next time if we see, you know, address, city, state, zip, and it's this exact value of like what, one, two, three, South George Street, uh, Chicago, Illinois, 60642, um, we already have the latitude and longitude. We are not gonna waste our time and ask Google to get us that information. It's just gonna use the latitude and longitude coordinates that we've already received in place on the IBM I. So things will be faster. So really what I'm getting to is that as a developer, if I'm gonna, I'm creating this map for the first time before I release it to the users, I would you know, create this map, create my application, save it, and then I would load it, launch my app, the application first, and then wait for it to get all those locations because it could take a lot of time because if you don't have the paid API, it's gonna take, it, you know, we have to buffer the request. You know, it's four or five a second or something. You know, another thing could be too is, and then, it, then I, as a developer, I come in and I'm, I'm using, I'm making a similar map and I decide to put a comma between my city and state. Well, we're gonna see that as a different address then, so it's not gonna find the cached copy. That's a really good so, point. So just you know, among your team, it's, it's, it's nice to try and have a, a standard where you know, how you're plotting these addresses out. I mean, it's not the end of the world, it'll cache it again, you know, but it might help in the long run. Right. Hey, can you go back to that marker title? Mm -hmm. Can we can we wrap like some bold tags around that C name and then break it and then output address city state just to show how you can mark this up a bit? And then maybe we just break and do uh, I don't know address one, and then break and city right. comma state. So the point is, H any HTML markup is valid in here. Which looks a lot better. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um. Not sure about data. Standard auto refresh, maximum markers that you want to show on this map at run, like not here within Builder, but it's running. Um, leave that time. Um, <clears throat> UI is so the title. Some of these we will go over late in a different data source. I don't, you know what I mean, Sean? Because I have set up a data source for certain ones of these. Right. But, yeah. Um, so I'm going to disregard these two right now, and we're just going to move to here. So if I don't know if you want to talk over this one, Sean, the marker zoom and map. Sure. I mean, so this is maybe it's just easier just to demonstrate if, if, if Johnny were to zoom this all the way back, let's say. So this just means when it, when this map loads, how high up. <laughs> or far down. Okay. So, so that's a bit extreme. Really there. extreme. So now if we go all the way to the other end, I wonder what that's going to, that's a little extreme. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's really, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but if you, maybe if we, if we kept it that far over and changed the map type, you know, maybe sure. it would make more sense. We do hybrid. So that does make more sense. But if you if you had this, if you had a high zoom on and you had in your in your nav application, let's let's say you were pulling, you know, you were filtering the map widget down to uh, you know multiple markers. 
Well, obviously, if those markers weren't in the same area, it, it, it would not be able to zoom as far as it's zooming because, you know, let's say this is showing something in Illinois. And then if you had another marker showing in California, yeah, you wouldn't be able to zoom like this. Although I think the map would, would handle it for you, but in case you wonder and go, hey, how come it's not showing up close? Well, because they all need to be in the same area. So if you're just filtering down to one address, then there really are no limits. Right. And then if you did have multiple markers and you had your zoom all the way over and you, you notice that the initial view is, like Sean said, more spread out because it's gonna show you all those, it wants to show you all those markers at once, then the user could just start moving the map around and zooming in on their own, right? What's that default, that map default? Oh yeah, that's a good point. So when the map initially loads, even if it doesn't have data, we need to have a specific location, a default set location where it's, where Google needs it to represent. And then you add markers and you start adding locations. Um, Initially, I think when we first released the map, I think we set it as our CNX core for CNX address. Um, however, you can set that as a, you can change that in settings. So if I went to yeah, portal admin, um, really this this default map location really only comes into play when you have a long loading data source because in in, in the background we need to show some location before your data comes back. Right. Or, if the, it, or if it's not, it, there is it, it, no filters applied, but I'm showing the map. True. You know, it needs, it needs to be set somewhere. So <clears throat> you can go in here and set the default location to wherever you'd like. And, and again, this is, would just be like if you were typing in Google Maps. So it could be an ad address, just a, a city or a state, you know, et cetera. <coughs> And then, of course, at each map, <clears throat> sorry, at each map level, you could change the default. So even though you have a setting, right now our setting is Chicago, I could override that to be a different location for just this map widget. Um, yeah, I think that would be it until we want to hit these two. Yeah. Okay. So let's move on to that. So I did create, I have a statement. So it's so just more <clears throat> uh, fake data for, this is specific to the map. So we just have a, a column that's step. So one, two, three, four, um, an address and a title. We just have four of them. So this almost looks like a, like a delivery route. Start at this address, go to this address, go to that address and end here. Right. I'm gonna create the map widget over that data. And I'm gonna quickly just throw, okay, so I want address in there. And it's simple because the address is already all set. Um, we're seeing one marker again. Um, and we'll throw a marker title here. And then the UI, let's get to the UI. So this is where the show marker index and draw marker path comes into play. Show marker index will be, it's just based off the, the row, the, the index of the rows that are returned back from that SQL statement. So however that, if your order, you know, we had a step column, which was numeric and it was one to four and the order by on that statement was step ascending. So you're going to have the first step, second, third, fourth. Um, so basically every, every, so when you filter this widget in your nav app, 
what's it, it's just going to take, oh, it's, it's going to take the order that it gets and it's going to sequence them as one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, right? Yeah, the marker will just, the, the, the index of the marker will always be like, whatever the first marker we set, okay, it's one, and then it just keeps on going. And then we have this other option of draw marker path. This isn't going to show within Builder because we are set to only show one marker. What this means is that if we draw marker path, it, it's going to say, okay, when we load or initially load or like Sean said, filter this map widget, however, mar how, however many markers there are, starting from the first one, just like we were showing the marker index of one, two, three, we're gonna make a path. So we're gonna draw a line from one, from the first marker to the second, to the third, to the fourth. And like Sean said, it could be, you know, visualization of a, of a, of a route. So we so, need to get this in an application. Yes, I'm gonna save to really this. see it, huh? Yep. Okay. So I'm just gonna quickly just save this uh, map route. We'll throw it in an app so we can see the end result. So I'm looking for a map. There's my map route. And again, we're only seeing one because we're still in, in Builder. Okay. Save, save. All right, let's go find that thing. Map route. Okay, so now, <clears throat> now you can see what that map route and uh, show the index does. So the first marker that was set and it's just because it's the first row of your of the that SQL statements return was CNX. The second IBM I Rochester. And we went all the way over to Silicon Valley and then we ended at Las Vegas. If you turn off the draw marker index, we would just see one, two, three, four, right? Yes. Just gonna reload the frame real quick to get the update. And now we should just see the markers and no path. No. Cool. All right, so yeah, so those are some other options I know we've never touched on for the map that we've had people, you know, we added them because people wanted and needed them for, like Sean was saying, for showing routes of deliveries, etc. I think that's all what we had for the day. Unless there's anything you're gonna, you got well, Sean. Anybody's got any questions? Good ones. Could be off topic, doesn't matter. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, cause we are, what, half hour. Not bad. All right, well. All right, nothing there's no in. questions. Well then, thanks everybody for joining us. And again, we'll record this and we'll have it on our YouTube channel and, um, yeah, that's about it. So Oops. thanks again and enjoy the rest of your day. Oh, hold on. You know what? We oh. did get a question in here. Oh, okay. So, you know what? Then, uh, let's see here. Unrelated to today's topic, which is fine. Can you please explain how to add, expand the number of CGI jobs for valence on Apache to improve performance? Oh, this is going to dry. I, I always have to look this one up. Well, um, I could start by going to our... Patchy, if you want to start looking at one, I can't. It, it's act number of jobs or hold on. Is Rob on here? I bet he might know this off the top of his head too. I think it's like CGI underscore number jobs or something. Well, let me start with.
Hey guys, yeah, I, we have a, a blog post on that. Oh, perfect. Let me go to the let me go to the blog. You can still see my screen, and I'm at CNX Corp, right? I want to make sure yeah. I'm not sh okay. I'll probably have to search for it, right, Rob? Uh, yeah, I can tell you where it is. So yeah, yeah. Keep scrolling down. I'll tell you where where it is. It's like a, a queue of people in a line is the image so. <laughs> this there. one here we go nice okay so yeah bumping up the number of cgi jobs for serving your valence apps yeah so the default is i think five jobs so you can this kind of shows you where to go to change that perfect i think that's exactly what he was he or she was asking for Awesome. Everything you wanted to know and more. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, does that, uh, I think that should, should answer. So sweet. All right. If there's no other questions, even if it's off topic. All right, everybody. Well, again, thanks for joining us and have a good rest of your day. Thanks, John. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye.